Um, welcome to this first um, session of the seminar series, which um, seeks to explore um, today and over the next six or seven weeks um, the ways in which knowledge exchange, knowledge exchange and impact are framed, interpreted, practiced, articulated in different parts of the higher education research systems and from different perspectives, nationally and internationally. As we are all too aware, I think, um, in the UK uh, there has been extensive debates already around uh, knowledge exchange and impact. Um, funding bodies have incentivized um, impact activity and the reporting of impact in universities. Universities themselves have invested in perhaps increased infrastructure for knowledge exchange and for um, network building. Um, internationally as well, there have been many um, attempts across different research systems to try and capture and measure um, research impact and knowledge exchange activity in its, in its output to varying degrees of success. Um, in the social sciences and in a range of other disciplines as well as in other sectors as well that have been ongoing discussions and, and techniques and methodologies being proposed for again thinking about conceptualizing impact and measuring it. Um, and across the board, uh, my sense is that impact, despite all of this activity, remains a rather contested notion, which is beset by um, philosophical, practical and political tensions. So this particular um, seminar series tries to bring together voices from across the, education research, uh, the, the higher education um, system to discuss the ways in which we interpret and uh, engage with impact and knowledge exchange. So we'll be hearing from researchers, uh, we'll be hearing from research facilitators, we'll be hearing from the funding bodies, and we'll also draw in a number of international perspectives on research um, impact. Um, as you could see from the program, I, I hope you've all got a copy by now, um, the range of topics that we're going to address over the next six weeks is quite wide. Um, so we'll be focusing on um, uh, metrics, which is partly the topic of today's session, um, but also on narratives, um, narrative approaches to how impact is um, um, articulated. We'll be focusing on the REF, um, the topic of the next seminar in two weeks' time, but also on everyday practices in research uh, creation, generation, in research management, and in research facilitation. We'll be looking at um, research, or into academic practice and academic lives and identities. But also we'll be um, hearing some um, critical takes on evaluation uh, systems as a whole, and also some reflections on the role of critical research itself and its place in the wider discussions around impact. So through, and we'll be hearing from the UK and the UK perspectives, but also about international um, experiences. So through this wide range, I hope, of topics and of voices, we have to create opportunities for dialogue, for exploration, um, also for critique of the ways in which knowledge exchange is being an impact are being constructed and enacted throughout the higher education system. So I'd like to thank you for joining us and becoming part of this, um, of this discussion, and I look forward to today's talk and the discussion afterwards. So I'll hand over to uh, Professor Roger Goodman now, the head of the Social Sciences Division here at Oxford University, who is going to introduce the two speakers for today um, and share the discussion. Thank you. Glad to hold that. Um, <coughs> thank you, Alice. And thank you, Alice, also for all your work in convening this, uh, right. this series. It's the first time we've ever done something like this uh, in social sciences. And, uh, it's a really exciting adventure. And thank you also to all of the other people who have been supporting you this, uh, this uh, project. Um, this first session is going to be an interesting one because um, the structure is going to be that James is going to talk, I think, for about 20 minutes on metrics or so, and James and then David together will be talking about the campaign for social sciences and its broader impact. And then the hope is we'll open up for the general q and I think we can have a really good um, discussion. The timing couldn't be much better, could it? You know, we did choose the day before the election uh, to put you on the spot about what we think the impact really is going to be uh, of the election for social sciences, because I think there are huge potential issues um, that could arise from depending on what happens uh, tomorrow. No pressure. <laughs> anyway, how you, how you vote. Let me just briefly introduce both uh, James uh, and uh, David. Uh, James has, uh, well, both of them actually have extraordinarily interesting uh, careers. 
Uh, James was uh, at the, the director of the Science Policy Center for the Royal Society and then worked for the think tank uh, Demos, which is, I think, one of the most influential think tanks uh, for many, many uh, years. He's currently the professor of science and democracy at the University of Sussex. He's the director of a very major research program, the Nexus Network, which is funded by the ESRC and it links research policy and practice on the areas of food, energy, water. And it was exactly two years ago that he took up the role as chair of the campaign for social science. And that's something that we will be talking about. He also last year was asked by Hefty to chair the independent review on the role of metrics, which again is the topic we're going to start off talking about. And the other thing that is interesting, I think, about James's uh, personal biography is his links with places like Colorado and Beijing. Perhaps we'll push you a little bit on what social science looks like elsewhere, <coughs> and to the extent to which the UK is in line and out of line in terms of its, its social science. Uh, David uh, will be very well known uh, to you. Actually, the first time I heard David, I was on the phone a few weeks ago, and um, I recognized your voice immediately. It took me ages to work out why. And that is because David was a long time presented the analysis program on Radio 4, uh, and it was a voice that is very familiar. When he starts talking, most of you will immediately recognize uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying about an extremely interesting uh, career background, a very distinguished uh, journalist, but also worked in uh, many areas of public affairs. And for seven years, he chaired the ESRC's Methods and Infrastructure uh, Committee. During a period when I think the ESRC methods training probably changed more than it changed before, and I think we owe him a great debt, given that committee, for the work that they did in really bringing social science methods training, the doctoral training particularly, into, you know, the 21st century, we're a long way behind many of this um, field. He's worked at the Audit Commission, he's worked at the Royal Statistical Society, and he's deputy editor at Guardian uh, Public. Um, as a journalist, he's been a lead writer on the Times and a chief lead writer for The Independent before joining the Guardian as an analysis um, and editor. And has published books with Polly Toynbee, Jeremy Tumstrom, and Peter Hennessy. Timing couldn't be better. Uh, we're very much looking forward to what you have to say to us and looking forward to it. Again, yeah, that's what we ask you to keep up. I'm sure. I think I'll pass that to you. Yes, I think it's right. on. Great, well, thank you, Roger, very much. Um, and, and Alice as well, it's, it's a, a pleasure to um, have a chance to come and talk about both of these uh, linked uh, agendas. Um, as Roger says, I, I'm based. Um, day job down in Sussex, but I've been spending most of my time over the past couple of months, certainly, uh, travelling up and down the country talking about either one of the topics we're talking about today. This is the first time I think we've done them together, so, uh, so it, it hopefully will be a sort of beautiful, harmonious mashup up uh, rather than some kind of uh, Beyonce meets Metallica uh, <laughs> monstrosity. Um, but uh, I'm going to speak uh, primarily about the metrics review, um, and then David, I think, will say a bit about the... Uh, Campaign for Social Science Report, um, and, and yeah, we can open it up more broadly. We have done an event here at Oxford on the campaign report, and I, just to, so we clear, how many people here were at that, so we know if we're saying the same stuff that you, Roger, so just me. Oh, well, there we are. Oh, I'm more relaxed now. Well, well, we'll tell you about the campaign for social science report as well. Great. So, um, the metrics review. Um, as, as Roger says, this was something that was set up uh, at the request of David Willits. Um, flurry of activity towards the end of, of David Willis's time as, as minister, um, uh, under the auspices of Hefke, to look at this whole uh, explosion of activity in and around uh, quantitative indicators of varying kinds for research management and assessment, uh, both conventional, uh, bibliometric, uh, and related scientometric indicators, citations, opportunities, uh, you name it, uh, but also this uh, emergent, uh, very dynamic, somewhat a chaotic field of uh, alternative alt metrics, which are particularly associated with uh, a variety of forms of impact. Um, so uh, here we have David Willis announcing the review back in April, and I mean, the, the challenge he posed to us uh, essentially was, you know, here we have a period in which there's a huge amount of excitement and discussion about the power of uh, real-time analytics of big data, uh, as it's as it's come to be known. Uh, and a lot of research going on 
uh, into the potential of uh, those techniques uh, across a range of different uh, areas of, of economic social life. Um, to what extent can you, as the academic community, as the academic enterprise, direct the power of all of that back at your own activities and use uh, these uh, analytic tools to provide people like him, me, David Willits, uh, with uh, a better sense of what's happening in the research system um, and ways in which data that's being collected for uh, certain purposes, whether, it, whether it's internal uh, research management within a university or uh, larger, more uh, cyclical exercises like the REF, how can all of that data be used uh, in uh, other ways that are, that are valuable, for example, for biz in setting the direction of uh, research and innovation policy for the research councils for uh, Innovate UK, uh, uh, to give just a few examples. So that was the sort of context, and, and certainly for Willits, he, he was quite excited in a rather Willits-esque way about uh, all of the, you know, he sort of been, spent a day with Mendeley and he looked at altmetric, he was, he was, you know, excited about this stuff, wanted to know would it work. It's rather different to the last time uh, this question was posed, which some of you I'm sure in the room will recall. Uh, just around 2007-08, as the, as the RAE was uh, transforming itself into the REF, uh, there was an earlier um, a push from particularly the Treasury, John Kingman and others, to uh, move wholesale to a metrics-only uh, system for, for the REF. Um, and there was a precursor exercise to the one that uh, I've been uh, involved in over the last year that happened at that point. It was a, it was a sort of smaller undertaking in, in, in many ways. Um, and it came to the conclusion that it would be a bad idea to go uh, uh, in that direction. So there was a, a sort of push back from the community to uh, the Treasury and others who were, who were trying to uh, advance that agenda. This time around, we haven't had anything like that sort of political pressure around it. Um, David Willits met with us a few times at the start, has been, you know, was very open. Greg Clark is his successor. Similarly, I mean, they, they're, they're interested in the question. They're obviously keen to think about the potential for all of this to reduce cost, to reduce administrative burden, uh, in large part because we as the academic community are constantly complaining to them as ministers about uh, the burden of exercises like the REF. Um, but there hasn't been this sort of you know, hard push to reach uh, uh, any position. It is genuinely an independent review. Um, I have been uh, assisted in the task uh, by a fantastic group of people. I'm pleased when looking at the series that you've put together here uh, uh, for, you know, for this next three or four weeks, that, that you've got uh, several uh, of my colleagues from the Metric Review uh, steering group, which I suppose we take as a, as a positive endorsement, we've got the right sorts of people. Um, but it's, it's a very good, good group, um, uh, obviously a range of different disciplines, representatives of Royal Society, British Academy, uh, Wellcome Trust, RCUK, um, a couple of uh, really good um, science matricians, uh, Paul Bouters, who some of you may know from uh, runs the centre at Leiden. Uh, Mike Thelwall, who works uh, from computer science in the field of altmetrics uh, at Wolverhampton. So uh, it's been a great group, and we've worked really hard at this, actually. I mean, it's always with these review processes. You're never quite sure when you start how much work is going to be involved, how they're going to play out. We, for good or ill, have taken our task quite seriously and spent uh, a lot of time <laughs> in trying to really dig into this debate to understand its complexity to understand how it's moving and to talk uh, very broadly across the research community with uh, uh, a whole range of different uh, actors to get, uh, to get their views. So in, in brief summary, uh, our approach has been this, as I say, a diverse steering group. We had a, a broad-based uh, set of terms of reference, uh, uh, certainly broader than, than the last time this was, this was looked at. We've tried to be very transparent. Uh, by publishing uh, all of the evidence we've been gathering as we've gone along, publishing our minutes. Uh, we've done, as, as you would expect, uh, an in-depth literature review. We had a formal call for evidence last year, uh, to which we had 153 organisational uh, and individual responses. Um, and then we've run a series of stakeholder uh, workshops, picking off particular bits of the debate. Um, so, uh, for example, Alice spoke, uh, gave a fantastic presentation at one we ran uh, at Warwick, a few months ago, looking specifically at the arts and humanities, uh, um, and there'd be various others looking at equality and diversity, uh, etc., etc. Um, and we've also tried to bring in some of the more uh, ferocious sort of critics of this whole uh, of the impact agenda of, of any moves towards 
uh, greater use of metrics and get them involved in the events, get them involved in the debate, which I think has generally been quite productive. Um, we've also undertaken a quantitative exercise, to, which I'll explain a bit more about in a moment, to look at what would have been the uh, result of REF14 had we used uh, a basket of 15 quantitative indicators. I'll, I'll show you which ones. Uh, we'll be publishing the full detailed results of that correlation exercise in, in our report that's coming out uh, on the 9th of July. Um, and, of course, we've also been linked to and, and drawing from, feeding into, this whole raft of evaluation projects that Hefke has uh, commissioned and in some cases undertaken in-house to look at different dimensions of REF14. I think uh, whatever our views on the pros and cons of the REF and the way it's evolved, uh, Hefke do deserve to be uh, applauded for the thoroughness with which they've tried to uh, evaluate uh, uh, all these different dimensions of uh, REF14. Uh, and some of the stuff that's come out has been really very interesting, I think, particularly the, the, the work on the impact case studies that uh, King's College London and Digital Science have done, um, but a number of other projects as well that RAND and Technopolis and, and various other bodies have done. So we've been drawing on all of that. And we decided very deliberately not to publish our review uh, at the same time as all of those evaluations because we wanted to take account of uh, what they had to tell us. So um, at the same time in March that those um, uh, evaluations were published, I announced some initial findings of the review, which I'll, I'll go through again with you now today, um, but the rest of what we have to say will be coming in, in, in a few weeks' time. Um, these are just a few of the uh, online responses that uh, the call for evidence um, elicited. Uh, uh, of course, a lot of the providers, publishers in this area um, have been uh, uh, arguing to us often quite strongly in favour of greater use of metrics. Elsevier particularly uh, has, been, uh, has been very vocal on this. Um, David Colquhoun I put up there as one of the critics, some of you will know David Colquhoun, the Emeritus Professor of Pharmacology at UCL, and uh, he uh, groups metrics together with uh, homeopathy and witchcraft, which is three of the great uh, uh, evils uh, confronting uh, modern science. Um, this one down here was, was a, a collective response from over 200, mostly social scientists, um, which was, had some very thoughtful points to make. Um, and then one down there from Cameron Nayland, who again, some of you will know, a big figure in the open science movement uh, at PLOS, and, and that represents uh, one of a number of results that, that, that weren't sort of hard, pro or anti, but were trying to take a, a more sort of delicate, nuanced path through this terrain and, and identify positives as well as negatives. Um, this is the title of the report uh, that will be coming out um, on the 9th of July. Um, Cynics. Uh, I guess may say that uh, however thoughtful and well-intentioned this exercise, uh, we're perhaps a bit like King Canute, uh, unable to resist the uh, inevitable force uh, of ever more intrusive, onerous uh, and automated regimes of audit uh, and accountability that are a uh, feature of modern academic life. Um, and I've certainly been amused at various points uh, over the past six, nine months to see uh, some commentators uh, within the sector uh, writing about the review as if its conclusions are, are a foregone conclusion that you know we've sort of stitched this up at the uh, you know the last monthly meeting of the neoliberal thought collective and decided that uh, 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 its metrics uh, you know all the way um, that's not what we've done uh, and I don't see uh, see us as as, as commute um, rather as I said at the Hefke event a few weeks ago I'd, I'd likened the, the reviews uh, role to that of, of, of the Thames barrier like encouraging uh, a flow of responsible uh, and sensible uses of indicators and data into uh, HE and research management, but where necessary raising principled evidence-based arguments to prevent uh, all those things that are most precious to us in academic culture uh, and research culture from being uh, drowned or flooded by uh, naive or inappropriate uses. So that's the, that's the, the kind of line that we've been trying uh, to, to tread. Um, the report, when it comes out, will of course look at the REF, and that's the bit that people are most interested in. Um, but very importantly, it will also say a lot more about quantitative indicators across the research system. There's a big chapter on how uh, they're being used in HEIs, uh, another on other parts of the research funding system, RCUK, uh, Wellcome, Europe, National Academies. Interesting questions about interoperability between things like research fish, as one part of data capture and 
and processes like REF 2020. Uh, so lots of, of, of different elements. Um, what I'm going to talk about now will be mostly the REF stuff, because that's the bit that we've pre-announced. Um, a few uh, sort of headlines on context, uh, as the uh, responses I showed earlier uh, illustrate, um, there is a lot of, of uh, uh, heat around this debate, which I think is, is, is understandable. Um, and metrics as a term, I think, can often be uh, a hindrance rather than a help to having a, a, a more measured, sensible understanding about uh, the use of data, the use of quantitative indicators in the system. Um, there are very deep feelings um, in, in very broad brush terms. 57% of the formal responses we had to our call for evidence were uh, sceptical about any moves towards greater use of metrics. Um, there's, of course, a lot of uh, uh, sensitivity required in respect of disciplinary diversity, different cultures and practices around citation uh, and other uh, modes of scholarly output as well as impact. Um, our view throughout, and I'll say more about this in a moment in terms of our initial conclusions, is that uh, any uh, greater use of metrics uh, would always need to be uh, brought alongside the continued value of expert judgment as uh, manifest through peer review. Uh, within the system as a whole. Um, of course, anything you do in this area depends uh, very heavily on the quality of the data that's going into the system. Uh, and so when we come to talk about our recommendations, a lot of it ends up in the terrain of improving uh, uh, data standards, data capture, harmonization, uh, interoperability of different systems. You know, it's quite sort of technical stuff in some ways, but it's where uh, this debate really sort of becomes uh, real in practical terms. Um, and there's a need, of course, to behave responsibly, considering preempting negative consequences. And I think we as a group have weighed very carefully uh, arguments in favour of moving further down this road uh, with those sorts of considerations uh, around research culture, around quality diversity, uh, and, other, and other factors. At the same time, there clearly is both a potential, technologically, practically, managerially, and uh, in many courses, appetite. It's not uniform, the opposition uh, to this. Uh, so um, if you can do it and do it well and do it sensibly, uh, this is something that uh, I certainly feel, as a community, we should uh, uh, embrace um, as long as we're going into it with, with eyes open. Um, we've drawn in our work on a few other really important contributions to these debates. I just pulled out a few of them here. Uh, one of the last studies I set up when I was at the Royal Society was this project on, on open science and, and the concept in there of intelligent openness as applied to open science. Uh, a lot of the arguments in there around data are very relevant to what we've been doing. Um, the Canadian the Council of Canadian Academies, uh, some of you will have seen this report from uh, three years ago now on informing research choices. I think it's the best, uh, beyond our report when it comes out, uh, uh, the, the, the best report, the best study of this issue. In, in the round to date, and certainly we found that very, very helpful. Uh, Dora, of course, uh, as, as one uh, sort of emblematic statement around particular journal impact factors. Um, and then more recently, uh, I'm sure most of you will have seen uh, in Nature uh, the Leiden Manifesto. This was a, an article that came off the back of a meeting in Leiden towards the end of last year. Uh, Paul Vouters is one of the authors of that uh, piece, and he, he's, he's on the group. Uh, Ismail Raffles, a colleague of mine, and Spru is another author. So, we've certainly found a lot of common ground in the, in the sort of philosophical framework that uh, reports like the Canadian One and, and statements like the Leiden Manifesto are uh, setting out. Uh, and we've used those to try and construct the uh, context in, in which we're then making quite specific, focused recommendations about what we do and don't do with all of this stuff in the, in the British research system. Um, we've also drawn on the wealth of uh, scholarly work that's gone on uh, looking at uh, regimes of audit in academia and elsewhere. I found myself digging back into Marilyn Strathern. More recently, uh, uh, some of you will see this, this, this lovely book by David Graeber uh, from the LSE, which uh, uh, is a great account of why uh, bureaucracies infuriate us, uh, but at the same time it exercise for many of us uh, a covert, guilty appeal. And, and I certainly found reading that uh, an interesting lens on, on some of the debates around uh, the REF. Um, in our discussion of the REF, 
we uh, look at the diverse views that are out there about the purposes of the REF. And I think one of the problems in general debates about the REF, which we're going to talk about in the discussion if we have time, is that we all know that there are multiple purposes. I think there are sort of three set out formally by Hefke, but there are others that have, uh, for good or ill, added themselves to the process as it's evolved. Um, and part sometimes of the talking across one another when we get debates about the REF comes from, I think, uh, um, a failure in some respect by Hefke and others to, to, to update the sort of codification, the description of what those purposes are. Um, and we will try and say a bit more about that in the, in the final report. Uh, we obviously talk about burden costs, uh, whether metrics can reduce burden, um, the balance between metrics and peer review, uh, concerns over unintended consequences, concerns over uh, differences across disciplines. So to get to the meat of it, and I've just got three slides now that take the three uh, headings uh, from the ref of output, uh, in, impact and environment, and talk about where we're at in our analysis of the scope for using uh, quantitative indicators. Our view on outputs is that it's not currently feasible to assess uh, the quality of outputs using quantitative indicators alone. Uh, uh, it, it might work better in certain uh, disciplines and under certain ref panels, but it certainly doesn't work across the piece. Um, and it certainly doesn't provide you with the richness of judgment that we currently derive from the ref uh, as, it's, uh, as it's been carried out. Uh, there are real concerns over um, bias, equality, and diversity. Uh, they're not all one way. There are arguments in favour of metrics as a sort of bulwark against uh, um, you know, uh, forms of, 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 of inequality in the system. It's interesting, one of the reasons that Portugal as a country has gone hard for, for metrics is that it's seen as a way of, of guarding against uh, other problems of, of you know, nepotism and, and uh, uh, bias in, in, in the university sector. Um, but in general, there's real worries about the university, particularly around gender uh, and citation. No set of numbers, as I say, can capture the multifaceted nuanced judgments uh, on research that the REF provide. Uh, quantitative data do have a place, though, in informing peer review judgments. They were uh, used by some REF panels. Panels could choose whether or not to take citation data uh, as a contribution to their deliberations. Uh, that could be developed further. There's more work that could be done to enrich the, the data set available to panels uh, and also to train panel members in uh, um, appropriate and inappropriate uses. Uh, but you know, when you talk to panel members, and we did a whole series of focus groups with REF panel members, you find that data in general being used uh, to, uh, you know, not, not, not to form primary judgments but to help navigate between borderline cases. You know, is it a three, is it a four? Oh, well, let me reach for the citation data and maybe that will, that will help. Um, our correlation project, as I mentioned, uh, has been a really interesting exercise. Um, we looked at uh, all of the individual outputs that we could, Well, it's very interesting that we had to drop 50,000 straight off because they didn't have a, have a DOI, and that just highlights immediately uh, one of the problems uh, here. Uh, and you know, when you hear Elsevier talk rather uh, sweepingly about the potential to move to, to metrics in, in REF 2020, you know, I, I do want to say, well, what about the 50,000? <laughs> about 50,000 outputs, many of which, of course, are in arts, humanities, and social sciences, although so not exclusively, some are in engineering and other, and other natural sciences. Uh, um, the data was then linked into uh, uh, HESA star characteristics and it was anonymized. So, so, this is a bigger undertaking in terms of correlation than has been, uh, than has been carried out in previous uh, exercises. Um, and we actually got hold of the panel level analysis before all the paperwork was uh, uh, burned in some ritual bonfire in, in, in Bristol. Uh, these are the indicators that we used. So I won't go through the more details citations, the varying forms, uh, authors, We're coming down to the red ones, Mendeley reads, uh, right down to tweets, uh, Google Scholar sites. So, you know, it's not a total basket, but it's a, it's a fairly useful uh, uh, set. Um, and uh, as I say, full results will be out in July. It's all over the place, would be the, the sort of short uh, summary of, of what that exercise tells us. There's limited coverage in some disciplines, particularly panel D subjects. Uh, raw correlations vary in strength, um, depending on UOA. Uh, but what we've been trying to do, what we'll say more about in the July report, is, is less 
uh, raw correlation, well, we also talk about raw correlation, but, but more importantly, in a way, the, the, the predictive power of those uh, um, uh, in, in thinking about uh, uh, the actual outcome of the exercise. Um, and, you know, I'm sympathetic to the argument, I mean, Dorothy Bishop here, for example, makes this very eloquently, uh, that you could do, you know, you could do a ref, you could do a resource allocation exercise to spend uh, that half of the, of, 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 of the system, the QR line of the, of the public research budget, uh, in, in a large number of, of particularly natural science disciplines using metrics. But you couldn't do uh, an exercise that brings all of the other uh, dimensions of the REF uh, as, it has, uh, as it has developed. So that's really one of the tensions around burden. Uh, on impact, very similar, I won't go through this in such length, it's not possible. Uh, and this comes out of the work that Digital Science and Kings did. Um, uh, there is potential around the edges to enhance uh, some uh, uses of quantitative data in the narrative-based case studies, you know, making sure people use standardised units of measurement for currency, for example. You know, don't have one case study in euros, another in pounds, another in dollars, whatever. Uh, to, take, to take a simple example. Um, uh, but in general, uh, particularly we've only just done it once in 14, the sense is we stick with uh, um, a narrative-based uh, approach. Uh, on environment, which is the, the sort of bit that often gets less attention, actually there's more scope to do stuff with metrics. And this has come out from the panels themselves as well as from our work. Um, so there's some quite interesting stuff that can be done. Because, of course, as you're moving it up to that level of analysis, you're you know, removing some of these other problems, but you, you know, you're looking in a more uh, uh, plural, diverse way using a set of indicators uh, at, at, at a, a, a unit in broader terms. And, uh, there is some scope, I think, to uh, do more there, and I think that will be taken forward in the next ref. Um, on costs, I'm going to speed up because I'm eating into David's time. Uh, it, it, it's commonly assumed it would cost less. It's much less straightforward when you get into the real detail. The cost of cleaning up the data, using it wisely and sensibly, is not, of course, uh, cost-free. Um, uh, you know marginally it could be cheaper uh, but it's not a sort of magic solution to, uh, to all this. Bearing in mind particularly as we'll discuss in the report, HEIs are doing this stuff anyway. I think there's an interesting debate, again we could have this about whether you, know, you would move over time to uh, a more regular rhythm you, know, you could have more annual cycles using a combination of metrics and then uh, periodic, uh, peer, -based, uh, peer review based assessments but uh, uh, in general, there is not a, an easy solution. Infrastructure is absolutely critical. We're going to come out very hard in favour of ORCID uh, uh, as a mandated uh, feature of uh, REF 2020. Uh, for some of these other uh, tools and, and standards, there's a more of a, a nuanced debate to have. I mean, Snowball is a good example where you know, some people are very pro, others are more cautious. Uh, but in general, identifiers, things like that can be, you know, a lot can be done at the level of the sort of plumbing of the system through things like ORCID numbers, uh, over which then one can use a variety of different systems, whether that's uh, research fish, pure, whatever you're using to capture stuff at an HEI level. Um, so we'll be saying quite a bit about that. So on REF, in summary, continue to provide panel members with bibliometric data, uh, increase though the sophistication of information provided, uh, still leave individual panels with greater autonomy, with autonomy to decide how much, if any, they do use of all of this. Uh, on impact, encourage a bit more quantitative evidence uh, in case studies, but remain uh, 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 with a narrative uh, approach. Uh, on environment, there is stuff that can be done to enhance uh, quant data, uh, particularly to actually provide panels with, with better, a richer contextual sense of uh, what's going on in, in, in individual UOAs. Um, so, to conclude, we're still just about in listening mode. I'm obviously interested in comments. Uh, we are deep in uh, drafting of the final report. Uh, I'm just tinkering with recommendations of the train on the way here. Uh, we'll be publishing on the 9th of July uh, recommendations for all of those different groups. Um, the sorts of messages are the ones I've been saying. Quantitative evaluation should support, should support qualitative expert assessment. Uh, we need to make data collection uh, and analytical processes open, transparent and simple where we can. We need to avoid misplaced concreteness and false precision, something that comes out of the live manifesto. Uh, we're, we're not pro, nor are we anti, 
we've been exploring this idea of responsible metrics as a kind of phrase linking into this broader agenda around responsible research and innovation that has gained some currency uh, here in the UK and at the European level. Um, and, you know, if you look at this in totality in respect of something like the REF, it's not, uh, certainly from our report, something that can be uh, changed quickly or overnight. Um, we certainly feel if you want an exercise like the REF, and we feel there is value in that, uh, you're never going to get to the point where you sort of switch off uh, the expert judgment element and go purely metrics, but you could progressively over time, if you improve these data sets, uh, increase uh, the contribution of uh, quantitative data to uh, that exercise and other exercises. Um, but it's a sort of, you know, a, a 10, 15 year rather than a five year transition. Uh, Hefty will of course be consulting on the design of the next ref uh, in the next few months. Um, and I think quite rightly the community wants certainty sooner rather than later as to how it's going to work. So that's metrics. I'm sorry I've talked for too long. Um, apologies. Um, but I'm going to hand over to David. Do you want to run the video? Well, I could, yeah. So, so business of people. So switching hats, campaign for social science. Although, I mean, metrics come very much into this analysis as with others. Uh, we put together this report, um, a couple of copies here, really to make sure that there was a strong contribution from the social sciences on the table at a time like this, as we go through not so much the heat of an election campaign, but particularly as we get into a spending review uh, with whatever uh, complexion of government we end up with uh, uh, next week, um, that there will be a strong focus contribution from the social sciences. So we're building on a lot of other things that have happened, which I'm not going to go through now because of time, uh, statements of solidarity from the natural sciences there, for example, from nature, uh, efforts around the place of evidence and social science in the mix in Whitehall, um, uh, other statements that have come from the National Academies, from the British Academy on Humanities and Social Sciences together. Ours then comes in as a focused contribution on social science. Um, we have a very short video, which we will just show you as a sort of quick summary, and then I'll hand to David to give him a few reflections on uh, the process um, that went into that report and will be continuing through the next few months. We've got things like the nurse review and others obviously ongoing. So this is only three minutes long, but it tells you a bit about this. Put together what we hope will be a robust, evidence-based report on the state and prospects for the social sciences in the UK for the next five to ten years. I think there are three main purposes uh, behind the pre-election report. Um, first, we want to draw together in the most coherent and compelling way possible all of the evidence that's out there for the contribution that social sciences are already making to um, the economy, to society, to public policy uh, in various ways. The social sciences on the whole is performing exceptionally well in the UK and that we should talk about the social sciences from a position of strength. Second, we need to set out uh, the critical conditions for maintaining uh, a strong social science base. The funding, the investment, uh, issues around the pipeline of social scientists. Um, and thirdly, we need to make sure that uh, the voice of the social sciences is there in the mix in those critical early months of a new government, uh, whoever wins the election. What's needed in the social sciences is this sort of focal point and a coherent voice pulling together these many strands to convey just how important the social sciences are in researching, thinking about, providing hard evidence on important policy issues. So for all of us within the science community very broadly, we have to be able to make a strong and coherent case. And to that end, it's critical as we think about the election and the choices in it, that we understand the necessity of support for a certain volume, a certain size of social science activities. The challenges facing this country, whether viewed from policymakers, viewed by firms, <coughs> viewed by households, viewed by individuals, will require, if they are to be dealt with, managed, uh, resolved, the application of, the deployment of, the enrichment of, knowledge from social science research practice activity. Well, I see very much in reading the, the business of people uh, a, uh, a, a common view that, um, that we need to uh, 
to maintain our commitment, we need to increase uh, our commitment to social sciences. We should uh, recognize the importance of social sciences uh, in the, uh, the whole family of sciences uh, as important for our economic future, as well uh, as uh, the future of our society and how we uh, think of ourselves uh, as a uh, as a society and as a nation. It's easy to completely uh, not understand the full impact of trained social scientists in business, trained social scientists in business around the world. There's both sort of working at the micro level and in this sort of applied way and saying yes we need social science for the, the reasons that Michelle has been talking. But there's also the sort of more structural contribution that social sciences make. The actual sort of science of innovation. How can we be most effective? Whatever you think about the architecture of a chief social scientist, <laughs> linking people who have that expertise to some real uh, acknowledged authority and budget it, it is helpful. It's absolutely imperative uh, that we continue to uh, invest in enthusiastically science and social science uh, in particular. <coughs> Right, in five minutes I'm going to try and get from that point back to uh, the main theme today, which is um, knowledge exchange and um, uh, uh, impact. Um, sorry, let me put all this. The main storyline of that report is, and I use the word advisedly, a positivistic one, which basically says the challenges confronting the nation, and that's a problematic entity I know, will need more, or at least a, 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 a quantum of social science uh, activity. So let me very briefly, thinking about tomorrow, give you some thoughts, um, not particularly original, about the next five years in terms of the terrain within which social science and the impact uh, agenda will play out. Clearly, austerity in various ways will continue. It might not paradoxically have a huge impact on the public budget, the science innovation, but around the edges, and certainly in terms of uh, children <coughs> levels, there are obviously great potentials for change and effects on higher education institutions. If there is a right of centre government, <coughs> then the, equality, the inequality, uh, the facts of growing inequality are unlikely to uh, be reduced. Um, ideological uh, predispositions against interventions by the state and hence against the whole field of potential public policy uh, activity will be uh, changing. Um, clearly, uh, given what the polls say about the prospect of the arrival of Westminster 59 Scottish Nationalist MPs, our consciousness, consciousness of the non-Westminster dimension of public policy and impact surely has to grow. There will be activity in Edinburgh, Belfast, and Cardiff of a growingly different kind, which anyone concerned about impact will clearly have to uh, register. And I'll briefly return to that uh, in a moment. Whether, in general, the government in power over the next five years will be more attuned to evidence, which clearly has an umbil um, umbilical relationship with impact, uh, remains to be seen. It could be that a Labour-led government recapitulate the interest in evidence shown, at least in the early years of the Blair uh, government. Um, Labour's uh, commitment, however, on, for example, HS2, uh, a project which consecutive studies have said is not uh, evidence-driven, may indicate, to cynics at least, that a Labour government would be no, uh, more friendly to evidence than a Cameron-led government, which clearly has pushed at a micro level an evidence agenda, but when it comes to macro policy, economic policy, schools policy, uh, policy on health, uh, has not been particularly interested in um, evidence. The conclusion has to be that the volumes of ideology and dogma that we've seen displayed uh, in recent times are unlikely to be diminished, and that broad proposition needs to underpin our thinking uh, about impact. If it is the case that there is a REF 2020, you are now in the business of securing your brownie points, because if you're not, you're leaving it uh, rather late in terms of the period during which you are meant to register your impact. So let me go on there and say a few words about 
um, uh, impact, particularly when it comes to uh, public policy. And I'm drawing partly on my own personal experience as a user assessor on the sociology sub-panel on the main panel C in the 2014 uh, REM exercise. Some obvious points. Um, impact is new. Um, impact, not using that word, has been built into the social science project in the United Kingdom for uh, many decades. People talked about, people had a vocation towards social change as social scientists, which was obviously uh, a commitment uh, to impact. We're aware historically that there was a turn in the 1980s towards uh, a new appraisal of expenditure on research and higher education, of which the impact agenda is now step um, I'll just use the, the phrase contested. Um, clearly impact, particularly when it comes to public policy, is problematic in many ways. I'm going to briefly give you uh, an example, again, from <coughs> personal experience that uh, might uh, illustrate that. But uh, James used the rather neat phrase, the neoliberal thought collective. Um, the neoliberal thought collective isn't terribly new um, in, in, in terms of its willing, its wish to see uh, impact uh, registered by people receiving public money for research. Um, it, 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 you could say it was in operation as early as the early 1970s, long before Mrs. Thatcher was Prime Minister indeed, when um, Lord Rothschild said that research should be commissioned uh, on a specific basis, that research money should only go out to those who have uh, met the criteria for a predefined uh, uh, project. Um, and if you look around now, it's not at all clear that impact is actually uh, geared towards producing results which the neoliberal thought collective would say it wanted, whether that's in terms of the corporate sector, the side business school, uh, or in terms uh, of government policy. But I wanted to give you uh, one example which I think explores briefly the complexity of the mensuration uh, of uh, impact. Um, King's College... Um, has done a, a data mining exercise, as James mentioned, looking at REF uh, impact case studies. Um, there were some nearly 5,000 of them which entered the exercise, some 2,000 of which, 30% um, of the total uh, of the uh, unredacted ones at least, were from social sciences, although we know that a third of those were in two areas, business and law. Um, now, the impact had to occur, I think I might be saying, between... 1st of January 2008 and the 31st of July 2013, during which period of time we might remember there were two rather significant events, one the recession uh, and its impact on public finances, and two, a change of government. Um, there may well be changes of government between now and 2020, and again, thinking about impact in terms of public policy, we somehow need to kind of capture um, the fact that the political landscape may be throws uh, of massive uh, upheaval. Again, I need to mention and underline upheaval in terms of the governance of the United Kingdom uh, and the arrival in power of the administrations in uh, the devolved territories, which may become, in case of Scotland, independent in the real time of the next uh, uh, REF uh, impact assessment. But I wanted to focus your attention briefly uh, on this. Um, the data mining exercise carried out by King's found from the social science corpus um, a surprising claim, as it's been presented, on impact in public policy terms, with 265 mentions of House of Commons select committees. Again, a parenthesis is that that appears to be the case. The data isn't necessarily as specific as that. It might be that people were referring to select committees in non-Westminster parliamentary um, Connections. That's not uh, clear. Um, it certainly, and a lot of these were claimed by um, contributors to Main Panel C, which was the uh, principal, so called, the only uh, social sciences uh, panel. And there was quite a lot of elision, according to the King's study, between mentioning uh, select committee uh, presence as an impact and claiming an impact on uh, public uh, policy. Um, I just wanted to register a, a surprise on my part that there should be such a rich claim made by uh, social science in that period of time, between 2008-2013, particularly 
in terms of select committees. Now, those of you who are familiar with uh, the UK Parliament will agree that, yes, it has been a second time for select committee invigilation uh, of the executive. We've had uh, quite a lot of select committee activity of a more energetic kind than uh, had been observed, partly as a result of reforms enacted during the, um, the Labour years, uh, the so-called right reforms. I've spent a little bit of time over the past five years talking uh, on a regular basis to the chair of the Public Accounts Committee, which is a not, not insignificant uh, select committee with uh, some uh, impact, one might say, on the conduct of public policy. And I just, because I was coming here today, did a little exercise looking at the first two years uh, of the quinquennium for the PAC between 2010 and 2012. And looked at the witnesses that the PAC heard in the light of that ref exercise claim about social scientists being um, uh, uh, frequent uh, contributors to select committees. And although over the period the um, PAC heard possibly some 300 uh, different witnesses, um, I could only count between 2000 10 and uh, the end of parliamentary session in 2012, um, five people who were identifiable social scientists, of whom two alone were academic social scientists. And if you want to know who they were, they were John Hills of the LSE and a guy called Mark Hellowell, who's a, an expert in uh, PFI from the University uh, of Edinburgh. Now, that doesn't prove anything at all, but it does, I think, underline a point that James made that. The, the calibration of impact. We, we, as the campaign, desperately believe in the need for impact and the need for social science to, as it were, prove uh, to the powers that be that it does uh, deliver. Um, but actually demonstrating that uh, in real time, uh, in real institutional settings, is not easy. Now, there are anecdotal uh, materials to bring to bear but if one is trying to use number, and clearly number is a, a very uh, persuasive uh, dimension, um, it's going to be particularly uh, difficult. Now, um, that is not meant to be a, a, a negative observation. <coughs> the numbers are important and uh, parliamentary um, activity by social scientists it exists uh, in volume and is very important. But um, I, I just thought I would cast that light on some potential uh, claims coming from the uh, impact agenda. Um, that said, the campaign uh, on your behalf, I stress uh, it's a campaign for social sciences and social scientists, not just in academia, but particularly those of you who are uh, researchers and teachers in higher education institutions, uh, will continue to articulate that argument that the challenges facing the country, and after tomorrow they may well be extremely deep and broad, uh, will ne necessarily rely upon the engagement of social science. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.